Christmas. A time of reconciliation. Christmas. A time of reconciliation. My brothers and my sisters, much of our history in this world is the story of many conflict. There are many wars in our world today. Wars between brothers and sisters. Relationships are broken. Human beings, we have a tendency to be very good at living in war and conflict with one another than it is to live in peace with one another. There is too much fighting among God's people. Families are broken. Nations are broken. Yet in the midst of all this, we hear the word of God that says to us, peace on earth. How can they be peace? Is there a way that there can be peace in our world today? Is there a way that there can be peace in our family today? My brothers and my sisters, without a transformation of our heart, even our education becomes useless. Without a transformation of our heart, even our education becomes an opportunity for us to think more on sophisticated ways to kill and to destroy one another. Somebody once said that science without conscience is the disaster of a soul. Science without conscience is the disaster of a soul. How we need the spirit of Christmas. How we need the spirit of Christmas. Because Christmas is about reconciliation. It is about the spirit of God. It's reconciliation. God has reconciled with us. There is an opportunity to reconcile with God. God bring peace between God and God's people. Then God bring peace to ourselves. Then God bring peace to one another. How we need the spirit of reconciliation. That restoration of peace. We need the spirit of reconciliation. But it is unfortunate my brothers and my sisters. That this morning I report to you that the spirit of reconciliation is in short supply today. The spirit of reconciliation is in short supply today. Among us, God's people, in the church, in the world, wherever we live, oh my brothers and my sisters. If we can just allow the spirit of Christmas to come. The spirit of reconciliation. If we can celebrate reconciliation. Knowing that reconciliation diffuses conflict. Reconciliation turns chaos into peace. It quiets quarrels among people. It turns tensions into tranquility. Yes, my brothers and my sisters, Luke chapter 2 verse 14 can become a reality. Let's read again the word of God. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth peace to those on whom the favor of the Lord rests upon. Peace on earth. Reconciliation with God is possible. But you see, if we reconciled with God, God wants us to be the men and Women of goodwill, those who will build, who are peacemakers in our world. Scriptures tells us in the gospel of Matthew, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called children of God. If you are a child of God, the duty of a child of God is to become a peacemaker. You cannot call yourself a child of God and be a troublemaker. You are a peacemaker. Now, when we talk about being a peacemaker, it does not mean that we live in a utopian world where we think there is no conflict. There will always be conflict between evil and good. Peacemaking does not mean resolution that to settle with injustice and just uh, be peaceful and avoid conflict. Being a peacemaker is to be on the side of God and engage God and engage God's people. 
You know, I can disagree with you and still love you. I don't need to hate. I don't need to hate somebody. But it is unfortunate that we live in a time where it's easy to demonize one another. It's easy to celebrate our differences. Differences have become stories of entertainment in our society today. Peace on earth and goodwill toward man. Oh, my brothers and my sisters, the other text that we read came from the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 3, verse 23, 28. To refresh your memories, listen again. There is neither Jew or Gentile. And now I want you to use your sanctified imagination. Wherever you are, whatever your preferences are, you can replace something there. There is no Jews, no Gentiles. If the Apostle Paul was writing to us in the United States this morning, he will remind you again. I know you are tired of me saying that. <laughs> it is God's words. It is God's words. In Christ, there is no Republican. There is no Democrat. In Christ, there is no liberal. There is no socialist. There is no capitalist. There is no conservative. In Christ, my brothers and my sisters, there is no slave, no free, neither male or female, for you are all one in Christ. This is what the Apostle Paul is reminding the church, the body of Christ, we who are supposed to be the light of the world, that we need to go transcend our own preferences, transcend what we feel is right, and maintain the unity of the body of Christ and love one another. Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you, love one another because of your love. They will know that you are my disciples, not because of your political preferences, not because of your theological preferences, but you are my children when you love one another. Love. Agape love, love without expectation, unconditional love. You love people anyhow because God loves them. We call that redemptive goodwill toward people. You don't love because my way appeal to you. You don't love me because you like the way I do things and the day I don't do things. You know how sometimes we discover that, oh, so-and-so does not agree with me. You know, one day somebody came to the office and asked me, what is your political party? I look at him and say, that's a wrong question to ask to your pastor. Uh, you want to know the political party I belong to? So what about if it's different from yours? Then you will change. And then you will be filtering everything I say in the lens of your political party because you will see me as your enemy. I know I don't have a political party. By the way, that is true. I'm, I don't have one. I read all about our political party. There are things that I love from both sides. There are things I don't like from both sides. So that is me, all right? Now, if you choose to belong to one, God bless you. You have the freedom to, be, to do that. But do not demonize anybody just because they don't agree with you. I don't know why the Lord has put this message on my heart. This time of Christmas, we need the spirit of reconciliation. We need to be reconciled with one another because if we harbor hate in our heart, our prayers are not going to be answered. We will be spiritually weak. We are at war with God when we do not love one another. There are things that do not please the heart of God. There are things that breaks the heart of God and one of them is hate for one another. Why? Because we love. We have been created all in the image of God. What would you say when you are a parent and your children do not like, don't love each other? Come on, parents. Those of you who are watching me online and those of you who are here, you are a parent and your children do not love one another. Every time they keep on fighting one another, will you celebrate? Are you going to have a party at your house and say, I'm celebrating the conflict between my children? Is that what you do? If it's not acceptable for us, why is it that we think it is acceptable to God? God's heart breaks down when God's children, all they do is to engage into fighting, demonizing one another. 
peace on earth. There will be peace on earth. Now you see, for someone may say, well, this seems idealistic. Because the problem of conflict is a universal problem. Yes, I agree. The problem of evil is a universal problem. But you know, this is why God sent Jesus. For God so loved the world that God sent Jesus Christ. Oh, my brothers and my sisters, we live in a time where we thought science and technology would bring a great development to us. At the same time as we celebrate the development that comes with technology and science. But there is also the unfortunate part that technology has brought to us. The polarization that we see. Just take the internet. A simple uh, technological progress that brought joy to the world. Uh, the internet has made the world become a small village where we can connect with one another. Oh, the beauty of being able to talk to my family in another continent. The beauty of celebrating that I can be preaching the word of God right now. And you can be listening to the word of God from the comfort of your house. Now imagine the same technology has brought polarization. Just look at the media. The media always plays up our differences to create entertaining stories. Oh, lost civility. How we have lost our civility in our community today. Because of the internet, people have become bully. There is rudeness, lack of sympathy and kindness. The people can stay, sit behind their small electronic device and say whatever they want to do, even at the expense of the detriment of other people. Rudeness is on the increase. There is no kindness. Oh, my brothers and my sisters, our society is broken. As I stood before the Lord, as I was standing here in front of you, my heart sank because I felt the brokenness. We are all broken. Our world is broken because the society, the community is made up with broken families. Broken family, damaged children, destroyed men and women. Emotionally, we are destroyed. Our world is made up with brokenness. And we can feel it. Peace on earth has become like a pie in the sky. We can see it. We can talk about it. But the reality is, we cannot experience that reality. Uh, you can fall into hopelessness. You can fall into giving up on yourself. You can say, I've tried my best, but it's not working. This morning, I'm encouraged by the word of the Lord. Glory be to God in the heaven. I'm encouraged by the words of the Lord. Peace on earth. And goodwill toward men. I still believe that God is able to intervene into our affairs. Like God sent his son. Divine intervention is real. God can intervene and bring peace to us. Peace within ourselves. Peace with one another. God can do it again in the name of Jesus the Christ. So as we celebrate Christmas, my brothers and my sisters, receive this good news of Christmas. A message, a time of reconciliation, a message of peace. Peace on earth. Peace on earth. Peace on earth. Good news to you. Good news to our family. Good news to us for chapel. God so loved the world and he gave his son. Yes, we are broken, but there is hope because Jesus came to become that bridge of recon reconciliation. Jesus came and took us from one corner of depression, of brokenness, to a place of peace, a place where God is working, mending our lives. God is transforming us and changing us in the midst of this brokenness. We are talking about rebuilding relationship. Let's go to the text on Ephesians. We are talking about building relationship. 
How can broken people rebuild which has been broken? Because the truth is I can only give what I have. If I have brokenness in me, how can I bring peace when I'm already broken by myself? But thanks be to God because the story of Christmas tells us that we are not to focus on our brokenness. We need to focus on Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Do you hear me, God's people? Don't focus on your mistake. Don't focus on your brokenness. Don't focus on your hurt. Focus on Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Focus on what God is doing. There is hope. Focus on Jesus Christ. Do not focus on yourself. For he himself is our peace. For Jesus is our peace. I'm excited. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. For Jesus is our peace. And I receive the peace of God. And I have hope to believe. He's our peace. He himself who has made the two groups, those who are divided into one. And has destroyed the barrier. The dividing wall of hostility. The dividing wall of separation. Christ has destroyed that. Yes, as we are called to become peacemakers. As we are called to rebuild the relationship. What does that mean? We rebuild as we are engaging into this process. Continuing to destroy the barriers between us, God's people. Continuing to destroy the dividing wall of separation. Human beings, we have a tendency to separate ourselves. Hostility is in our nature. If we are going to rebuild relationship, my brothers and my sisters, then we need to focus on what God has done. Rebuilding relationship requires that we embrace the spirit of Christmas. Christmas, a time of reconciliation. Strong relationships are built with a spirit of reconciliation. Now I want to share with you three things before I take my seat. The three things that kill our relationship. The spirit of reconciliation is broken. If we are going to build a strong relationship, we need the spirit of Christmas. And the spirit of Christmas is a spirit of reconciliation. Because Christmas itself, it is a time of reconciliation. It tells us about our reconciliation with God. Our reconciliation with ourselves. And our reconciliation with one another. This is who we are. And this is what God has done. Oh, my brothers and my sisters. There are three things that kills the spirit of reconciliation. Number one. If we are going to build a strong relationship, we need to be aware of these three things that kill relationship. Three attitudes that destroy relationship. These three will destroy your marriage. These three will destroy relationship at work. It will destroy relationship wherever we are if we are not aware and if we do not be aware of this attitude. Number one. Self-centeredness. If we are going to build a strong relationship, we need that spirit of reconciliation. What is it that kills the spirit of reconciliation? Number one is self-centeredness. Oh, my brothers and my sisters, I want us to reflect if there are barriers that we need to remove for our relationship to be strong. One is this attitude of self-centeredness. When I want everything my way. When I want everything my way. And when you want everything your way. My way and your way. Because I'm in my corner, I want my way. And you, you are in your corner and you want your way. What happened? Your way and my way clashes. They clash together. So we live in a tension. And we will continue to live in a tension. This is why the Bible is right. Where there is love, we consider one another. Love, te love teaches us 
to move ourselves from the center of our lives. First, we remove ourselves from the center. That's what it means to be a Christian. A Christian man, a Christian woman. It starts by you removing yourself from the center. When we give up the center of our life to God. When we allow God to be the center of our lives. Something happens. We stop being self-centered. We begin to allow love. The love of God. And the love for one another. We respect. We consider the ways of other people. And we realize that out of love, I can allow peace to prevail. Because if I have my way, and you have your way, one of us needs to give up out of love so that peace may prevail. Now imagine if my attitude is that I'm going to give up my way. And my wife also say, I'm going to give up my way. So it's not my way, it's not her way. You know how that marriage becomes strong? Because now we begin to consider what is common good for all of us. Then we begin to understand it's not wise to put the house on fire. By the way, do not put fire. Don't start fire. Because when that fire will start, it will burn you also. Don't think if you start fire and fire start, you may escape. Chances are, when the whole house is on fire, you also are going to cut up yourself in fire. Are you, are you listening to me? Are you with me? Don't you love God's word? Oh, hallelujah. Self-centeredness. This attitude must be moved out. If we are going to build strong relationships, we need to allow. We need to move away from self-centeredness. And I'm telling you, self-centeredness is a natural sin in all of us. Or you can justify your self-centeredness even in a spiritual place. That's the danger of self-centeredness. You can be in the temple and still glorify and celebrate your self-centeredness. When we talk about self-centeredness, we're not always talking about people who do not know God. We're talking about Christian people. You know, I used to be a member of my church and every time a preacher will come and preach about a certain subject, I'll get mad in my heart. And then I'll say, does he, he, he needs to find other scripture to preach. Why is he only preaching about that topic all the time? My self-centeredness did not allow the word of God to come and transform me because I wanted to cling to my own way. And I find all these good reasons to blame the preacher. Sometimes I got mad I did not go to church. I did not listen to the preacher because I did not want the way he preaches. But you see, when God wants to talk to you, you will not run away from God. Like Jonah. Jonah tried to run away. You cannot run away from God. So then I go to another church and the preacher began to preach the same sermon that I was running away from. You know, like some of you, you may close now. And I pray when you watch the other channel, you'll be hearing what I'm saying. <laughs> then the Lord was dealing with me until I gave up my pride and I made peace with God. I said to the Lord, come and change my life. My brothers and my sisters, if we continue to have the attitude of self-centeredness, we are going to have weak relationship. And the relationship, our relationship are weak because they, 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 there is this attitude of self-centeredness. Everyone wants their own way. No one is willing to give up out of the love that we have. If our country is going to be a strong nation, there must be some kind of love. That we all need to share with one another. We need to be reminded about our patriotism. You know, when patriotism is built on love, it builds a nation. But when patriotism is built on hate, it destroys the nation. We cannot just claim we are patriot. We need to be reminded 
We share this space. We are all Americans and we love our country. And because we love our country, we do what is right for the benefit of all of us. Even patriotism becomes detrimental if it's built on hate. Self-centeredness is dangerous. I pray as we celebrate Christmas, as we receive the spirit of reconciliation, that we will love our brothers and our sisters because God has brought peace, peace on earth and goodwill toward men and toward women. Number two, the attitude that destroy our relationship, things that make our relationship weak. Number two, unrealistic expectations. Unrealistic expectation. This attitude of expecting others to meet our needs. Needs that only God can meet. You know how many times our marriages are even weak? Because we got married with this sense that, okay, my spouse is going to make me happy. Your wife, your husband will never make you happy. Come on, somebody. Other people, nobody will make you happy. There are needs that only God can meet. Our emptiness. There is nothing that can compensate a broken relationship with God. Nothing can compensate a broken relationship with God. Oh, my brothers and my sisters, the emptiness that we have, it will never be filled by another person. Nothing. No ideology. No practice. Whatever you can do to feel that vacuum that is in you, the emptiness that we feel. Well, my brothers and my sisters, there is no peace for our soul when there is no God. Unexpected, unrealistic expectation in our relationship. We need to watch for that attitude. We need to reach for a new attitude if we are going to replace self-centeredness, and then if we are going to move away from the, this attitude of unrealistic expectation, then there is need for us to embrace what we call mutuality. Mutuality in our relationship. Mutuality in our relationship. Sharing of feelings. Respect for one another. Very important to notice because we live in a time and a culture that condition us to be very narcissistic. And to use put downs and name calling to demean and demonize those who believe differently. Oh, my brothers and my sisters, when we embrace mutuality, we have that sense of understanding. We share our feelings together. We put ourselves into other person's shoes. I love one preacher. He wrote a note when there was this riot, when the black... Life Matter movement started and people were going out and burn buildings. And people had different opinions. There are those who uh, were very disappointed and they cry and they did not want that the country is being burned, we are destroying. But this preacher wrote a piece that I love and it touched my heart. And he said, when you saw fire, when you were complaining about the buildings that were being destroyed, I saw a grieving community. I saw a grieving community. You see, it's perspective. It's perspective. You saw a building being burned. You see the fire. And you worry about the building. This preacher said, I did not see the building. Yes, I acknowledge the fire. I acknowledge the destruction. But I acknowledge the pain of this community that has been going through pain for all these years. Now there are those who will say, oh, all life matters. We never say, all oh, life do not matter. All oh, life matters, we know that. But when particular life, when one is hurt, the Christian attitude, that mutuality, because we share feelings, we do not leave anyone behind. When one cry, we cry. I don't know how to share this with you. As a pastor, sometimes I live in torment because, you know, I know I see the brokenness in people's life. 
I see how Satan has destroyed the life of many women and men, the life of many uh, uh, families. I have seen the brokenness. And sometimes I feel so bad because I said to myself, if only we can follow what the Lord says. Mutuality, my brothers, sharing of feelings. I feel the feelings of my brothers and my sisters. This is why I said to you, justice is corrective actions that we need to take to correct the injustice. And when we take those corrective action to correct the injustice in the land, it becomes righteousness. And God says, let righteousness flow down like a river. God says, I love righteousness. God said to Israel, stop with the singing. Stop with the celebration. Practice righteousness in the land. Why? Because righteousness lifts up a nation. Righteousness lifts up a family. So we need to watch out. Make sure that we don't have that unrealistic expectation. That we expect more from our brothers and sisters. I shouldn't expect more from you. I need to know your story. I need to understand where you come from. I need to hear your pain. Now, if I cannot put myself in the shoes of my brothers and my sisters, then I cannot say I love them. Pain is real. Every day when I sit at the table and I eat my food, I realize that in the world, there are families that eat twice a week. Can you imagine eating twice a week? Can you imagine? You're telling me, preacher, that is impossible. Yes, there are people in this world who eat twice a week. There are men and women who, even here in this country, the most blessed nation in the world, we still have family who are struggling with poverty and they don't know what to do. They are so depressed because they don't know if tomorrow they are going to be able to pay rent, if they are going to be able to put food on their children's table. Suffering is real. Now, you can choose to ignore other people's suffering and just define the world within yourself. That's self-centeredness there. When you cannot get out of yourself and understand my situation, my condition may be better, but there may be someone else who may not have this. And sometimes we are caught up into our ideological fight and we miss the point. Oh, May God help us as we celebrate Christmas that we will embrace the spirit of reconciliation. That we will learn to practice mutuality, sharing of feelings. Because God cares about us. God share our feelings of hopelessness. That's why God sent Jesus Christ. Do you hear me? Because God share our feelings of hopelessness. We were sinners, incapable of saving ourselves, not able to do anything. Do you know sometimes we find ourselves doing things that we don't want to do? We know it's wrong. I know this will destroy my family, but I find myself doing that. Even the Apostle Paul cried, I am miserable because I know what is right. But every time I want to do what is right, I find myself doing what is wrong. I'm miserable. He cried. And then he said, thanks be to God for Jesus Christ who came and took our place. God share our feelings. He shared our pain. That's why he sent Jesus Christ. God did not have unrealistic expectation. God did not just say, you do your best over there. Do my will. Otherwise, you are doomed. I'm going to judge you. God felt our pain. Oh, hallelujah. My brothers and my sisters, the other attitude that we need to give up if we are going to have strong relationship, we need to stop living in rebellion against God. We need to stop, to stop being at war with God. We need to offer ourselves unconditional surrender to God. 
My brothers and my sisters, we need to admit that God is God and that we are not God. We need to give up this false notion that we have, that we know what is best for us, that we know what will make us happy more than our creator. We need to give up this false notion that we know what is best for us. God the creator knows what is best for us. And if we are at war with God, my brothers and my sisters, we will never fulfill our potential. We will never experience peace and joy here on earth. We need to give up being at war with God because our hands are too short to box against God. We need to give up this rebellious attitude that we can pick and choose which one of God's rule we are going to follow and which one of God's rule we are going to ignore. Oh, my brothers and my sisters, we need to give up being at war with God. And when we do this, oh, my brothers and sisters, there will be peace on earth and goodwill toward all people. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Let's all of God's people say it, amen. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for your word. Spirit of the living God, I bring your people before your throne of grace. That they are pure by the word of God that they've heard. Sanctify us with your word and pour out your Holy Spirit upon us. That we will become the people that you want us to become. In the name of Jesus the Christ, our Savior. Amen.